everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. We'd like to uh, thank the friends, first of all, for the fabulous refreshments in the back and for everything else they do. The volunteers so much time um, to be able to raise money so that we can do programs like this and other things for the library. So I just want to thank the friends very, very much for all of their volunteer efforts. Um, <laughs> our guest this evening, our author, is Peter Zeitlin. And I don't have my glasses up here, so I'm going to try to really kind of do it. Peter is a freelance journalist and author whose work has appeared regularly in the Boston Globe, the Christian Science Monitor, the Los Angeles Times, Parade, and AARP Magazine. His res sorry, Rescued is his seventh book. He lives in Dover with his family and his rescue dogs. Please welcome Peter Zeitlin. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I left Dover at 3 o'clock. I learned the hard way coming up this way. If I don't get on the road by 3, it could be a two hour trip. So thanks for coming. We're going to turn off the lights so you can see the screen and not look at me. Um, I'm going to first tell you how I came to write this book and the book that I wrote before this one, which is also about rescue dogs, because <coughs> I was the most unlikely person you can imagine to have written these books. When I was married in the late 80s, pretty much from the get-go, my wife Judy said, we gotta get a dog. And I resisted. And then we had two kids, two boys. And of course, as soon as they could talk, they wanted a dog too. And I resisted. <laughs> Why did I resist? Because, well, first of all, I'm fairly compulsive about the house. We were busy with the kids. They, they made enough of a mess for me to contend with. And they pleaded for a dog. They promised they would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning in February <laughs> to walk the dog on sheets of ice, and I knew there was no way that was going to happen. So for years, I tried to keep them busy with other critters. We had hamsters. We had fish. We had turtles. We had a cockatiel. And on and on it went. I tried to keep them busy. In 2012, when my younger son was about to be a senior in high school, I had a change of heart. And in fact, what happened was, without my realizing it, I was actually set up to have a change of heart. Because my wife asked me if we could take care of a dog that belonged to friends of ours when they went to their son's college graduation up at Middlebury. And I knew this dog, his name was Riley, he's a black lab, wonderful dog. So Riley came for the weekend, he always wore a little ascot sort of thing, and he had his little bag, and he was a terrific guest, and I took him for walks, which lasted about 45 minutes, and we would go about 100 yards and come home, because he loved to smell everything. But anyway, you know, he was really good. And I think what happened was that I looked over the horizon a year, when we were going to be empty nesters. And I said to Judy one day, OK, well, let's look for a dog. I think I really took her by surprise. But in fact, she was expecting that response from <laughs> our babysitting for Riley. So I was on board, finally, with the idea of getting a dog. But I had no idea how to go about getting a dog. All we had decided was that we didn't think we were prepared to raise a puppy. So we were looking for a slightly older dog. And Judy and my son Noah, went to visit a couple of breeders to look at you know, dogs that they had that were a little bit older, and nothing really clicked. They went up as far as Maine. And then one day, Judy came home from a yoga class, and she said that a guy in her class had just adopted a dog through a group in Connecticut called Labs for Rescue. And it was the best dog he ever had. She said, what do you think about getting a rescue dog? If you had seen my face at that moment, I must have been completely nonplussed. Because I thought this is what a rescue dog is. This, this is how little I knew about this whole world. And I thought, okay, we live in Massachusetts. This is a little bit of overkill, but if that's what you want. Um, so, of course, she quickly educated me. She said, no, no, we're not talking about that kind of rescue dog. And what I learned, of course, is that we were talking about dogs like these. Dogs that, for whatever reason, have found themselves in situations like this, particularly down south in shelters. These are the lost 
the abandoned, the neglected, the abused, hard luck dogs who through no fault of their own end up in shelters like this. And um, since I've always in many ways been sort of predisposed to underdogs, I said, okay, I'm, I'm on board with that. But again, I had no idea how we would go about it. So we went on the website of Labs for Rescue and we started perusing pictures of the adoptable dogs. And we were scrolling through and scrolling through. And we came upon this picture. And I just took one look at this picture. I thought, that is the most earnest looking dog I've ever seen. And I literally started to fall in love at that moment with this dog, um, whose name was Albie. It was the name that the rescue gave him. And there was a short description of Albie, and then at the bottom there was a short link, there was a link to a short video, about 30 seconds of Albie. At the end of that 30 seconds, I was so smitten with this dog, and I was so already, I'm like, he's the one, I know he's the one, and I started to worry about him right then and there, and I said to Judy, can we go to get him tomorrow in Connecticut? Which is when I realized, when she told me, well, he's not in Connecticut, Labs for Rescue's in Connecticut, but he's still in Louisiana. Um, he, Albie was picked up as a stray in central Louisiana. He was about two or three years old, and brought to a shelter in the city of Alexandria, where nine out of 10 dogs that come in the front door never come out. So he really had to beat long odds to survive. And it was thanks to a volunteer at the shelter who took a real liking to Albie, and she kept buying him a stay of execution, literally. Because so many dogs come into these shelters every week, they run out of room. You know, It's not that anybody there enjoys doing this, but these are rural areas where the flood of dogs coming in is overwhelming. So Albie really had to beat very long odds. Now, I was worried about him. I was crestfallen when I found out he was still in Louisiana. Like, how, how do we get him? How soon can we get him here? So our volunteer coordinator down in Louisiana for Labs for Rescue, a woman named Carrie Toth, um, said she's going to get him on the transport as soon as she can. And it was in late June of 2012 that she called us and she said, there's room on the transport for one more dog this week, and Albie's going to be on it. So I was so worried about him on this trip. You know, I had no idea what transport looked like. I mean, I knew it was you know, a truck of some kind or a van was going to bring him from Louisiana up to New England. And I was just worried. Well, when Albie got to Massachusetts, as some of you no doubt, no, rescue dogs coming in from out of state are required to go into quarantine for 48 hours at an approved state facility. So this poor guy picked up as a stray five months in a high kill shelter, a noisy, awful place, on a truck for five days, going he knows not where, and then into another shelter for 48 hours in quarantine. When he hopped out of the car at our house, finally, he was a bit of an unguided missile, as you might expect. <laughs> and, but he was very sweet, but he didn't really, you know, we didn't know if he'd ever even lived in a house. We knew nothing about him other than he'd been picked up as a stray. For the first five weeks that he was with us, he wouldn't come upstairs. And we thought maybe he'd never been in a house, we had no idea, but he slept under the coffee table in the living room, where I think he felt secure a little bit like a den. I told Judy when I agreed to get a dog that I had one hard and fast rule about having a dog. And that was that we were not sleeping in bed with a dog. <laughs> you know where this is going. <laughs> so I, about five weeks into his being with us, he was very sweet, you know, and he was very quiet and well-mannered. It seemed to us that he was grateful in some way. Come on in. So he's sleeping under the coffee table for five weeks. One night it's bedtime and he's not under the coffee table. And I'm like, wonder where Albie is. And I go upstairs and I turn the corner into our bedroom. Aww. And there's Albie on the bed. And I took one look at him. I took one look at Judy. And I told Judy she could sleep in the guest room. <laughs> you know, this to me was a, was a big moment for him. I'd say this was his literal and figurative leap of faith. This was the moment he was telling us that 
he was home and that we were his family. I really believe that. And, you know, so he was, uh, I obviously, what was I going to do? I mean, you look at the eyes, right? So, but, you know, in those early days when he was with us, I looked into that face and I had so many questions. I wished I could have asked him. You know, I wanted to know, did you have a family? Did they abandon you? Did you run away? How did you come to be lost? How long were you wandering alone in Louisiana? It's the woods of central Louisiana uh, until you were picked up. And did anybody ever hurt you? Were you abused? And, you know, these were just mysteries. And in some ways, I think it's the mystery sometimes that binds us to these dogs. We just don't know how their world went wrong. But you look at that face and you know it's your job to set that world right. And so I couldn't answer those questions. But at the same time, I was taking him for a lot of walks and meeting a lot of other people with dogs. If you have a dog, you know. It's, it's, you just meet people all the time. And it seemed like nine out of 10 people I was meeting um, in the woods or walking around the lake at Wellesley College, I said, oh, my dog is a rescue too. He's from Tennessee or Texas or Alabama or Mississippi. And I started to wonder, why are there so many dogs like Albie up here in New England? I, you know, we adopted him from Louisiana, but I had no idea why, really. And so I really wanted to answer that question. Why were there so many dogs like Albie up there? And to answer that question, I decided to email uh, this fellow, Greg Maley. Greg actually was the guy who drove Albie north in a truck I'm going to show you a picture of in a moment. Um, and I, I had not met Greg because, as I said, Albie had to go into quarantine here in Massachusetts. If, we lived in Connecticut, we could have picked him up at the truck at a stop in Connecticut. But I emailed Greg, I explained that he had driven Albie North, I explained that I was interested in learning more about this, and I asked him if it would be okay for me to meet him somewhere along his route and travel with him to see what this was kind of all about. I thought he would kind of be a, a doorway into this whole world of, you know, these dogs coming up from the south. Well, Greg was a little bit reticent. He didn't know me from Adam. Yeah. and. Um, his, half of his life is spent in this truck. He leaves home in Ohio every other Monday for now 13 years to drive 4,500 miles over six days down to the Gulf Coast picking up dogs like Albie, who've been adopted by folks like us up here, 60 to 80 dogs per trip, and transporting them up to New England um, in all kinds of weather. Um, and I'll tell you, it is a grueling physically demanding job. Um, these 80 dogs, he and one other guy, they have to get them out for walks. They have to be fed. The kennels have to be clean. You have to battle snow and wind. But on top of it, it's a huge responsibility because he knows that every dog like Albie that's on that truck has beaten very, very long odds to get this trip up here. And he knows there are 80 families like ours you know, waiting with our hearts and our throats for these dogs to arrive. So it's a huge responsibility. I did persuade Greg to let me uh, come down and spend a night with him. I met him in Pennsylvania and ended up writing an article about it for Parade Magazine. And my wife, who's the generator of many good ideas, including getting a dog, said this really is worthy of a longer story. And so I ended up traveling with Greg on two complete trips that he made down south, and it resulted in the first book I wrote about Rescue Dogs, uh, Rescue Road, which Greg is sort of the narrative center of that book, but it's really the story, not only of Greg, who, who's the last link in this long chain, but all the people who had to play a role in getting Albie on the truck to begin with. The people who go to the shelters, and make life or death decisions and say, I think I can find a home for this dog. I don't think I can find one for this dog. People who patrol convenience store parking lots and dumpster sites and save these dogs, many of which are just abandoned or neglected or living you know, in terrible conditions. So it was really the story of all of those people. Um, and that book ended with what's called Gotcha Day. Gotcha Day is the day that people go, and if you're lucky enough, you can meet Greg at the truck. If you live in Massachusetts, you've got to wait. But um, it really ended with that, those scenes of people meeting these dogs that they've adopted for the very first time. And if you don't think 
these dogs know <laughs> something good has happened. You just look particularly at the picture on the right. Just meeting his, this dog meeting her family for the very first time. Um, it's, it's an amazing experience. So that was Rescue Road. And um, someone, I don't, I don't know how this got started, but I think it started with somebody posting a picture like this on Greg's Facebook page. Rescue Road Trips is the name of his um, outfit. And it became kind of a thing. And so I started getting a lot of pictures people were sending to me. <laughs> and um, not everybody thought it was the, so interesting. Um, well, but here's what I, but, So I got about 200 of these pictures, and I only show this one because it's my favorite. <laughs> and the thing I really like about it is there's not a trace of remorse on this place. <laughs> So that was Rescue Road. So the new book, Rescued, in a sense, sort of takes the story from there. What, is, what happens to these dogs once they join us? You know, what, how do they transform our lives? What adjustments do we have to make to make their lives good? And I just want to start by talking about this question. So why adopt a rescue dog as opposed to going to a breeder or a pet store? And rather than give you a list of reasons. I'll start with a little bit of information and a, and a couple of stories. So to the extent that many people think of this as a, a problem, the, you know, the dogs needing homes from the south, they tend to associate it with events like this, or Hurricane Katrina before it. Um, so this was, of course, you know, um, the fall of 2017 when a series of hurricanes hit the south, and this problem sort of, you know, Everybody's consciousness got, you know, attracted to this problem again. Now, you know, in the city of Houston, there's an estimated three quarters of a million stray dogs. So when things like this happen, it's it's a it's a really dire situation, not just for people, but for these dogs that are fending for themselves on the street. Now, some people in circumstances like this do the right thing. Uh, many don't. And, you know, these are really tough things. And I want to tell you a story about a Hurricane Harvey dog. Um, it's not in the book, because this all happened after the book was written. This little puppy was found during Hurricane Harvey, abandoned in a shoebox near an elementary school in Dickinson, Texas. Dickinson, if you think back to the news coverage of the hurricane, you'll almost certainly remember a picture of these uh, women in a nursing home sitting up to their breastbones in water. That was Dickinson, Texas. So this poor little puppy is found by somebody, a good Samaritan, who brings her to a shelter in Dickinson, um, Bayou Animal Services. She was sick with parvo. Many of you know parvo virus is typically a puppy this young, uh, lethal. And lucky for her, the fellow on the right, who I first met while working on the first book, and I spent some time, I spent time at his house, and he features prominently in, in Rescue Road. His name is Tom English. Tom's house had fared fine in the hurricane. He was able to get up to Bayou Animal Services just to volunteer. He's a prolific rescuer himself. Um, he has adopted a shelter in southeast Texas that he's helped turn the euthanasia rate around from 80 to 20 percent. He works really hard to get these dogs adopted. Um, and he's very well set up at home with a lot of kennels. He's got a lot of experience. He's not a veterinarian, um, but he worked out a treatment plan for this puppy with a veterinarian that was volunteering at the shelter, too. And I will come back at the end and tell you uh, what happened to this little dog named Stormy. But let me talk about it. Again, why adopt a rescue dog? Because there are millions of dogs like Stormy every year that need homes. As I mentioned, this is a chronic problem. It's not just driven by severe weather events. Um, as I said, the estimates are three quarters of a million dogs living on the streets of Houston. One of them is, was this dog, Noah. So I did write about Noah in the book, and this, it's, a, it's a happy ending, trust me. Um, he was found in a part of Houston where a lot of people dump unwanted dogs. Very sick, the volunteer who came upon him uh, thought that he was dead, had multiple infections, um, mange, um, you know, insect bites, turned out to have heartworm, a very, very sick dog. 
Lucky for him, he ended up with a woman named Kathy Wetmore, who runs an outfit called Shaggy Dog Rescue in Houston. She's a one-woman operation. Now, some of these rescues are, you know, they've got staff, they've got a lot of volunteers. Kathy's a one-woman operation, and it's a really good one. And she agreed to take Noah on and invested $10,000, mostly of her own money, to get him ready for adoption. When you pay an adoption fee to adopt a shelter or a rescue dog of a few hundred bucks, it's almost always much less than the money that's been invested to get that dog healthy and ready for you. Um, Noah was adopted um, by Andrea and Linda, a couple that live in Brooklyn, and they have another rescue dog, Sadie, you can see on the bottom left. And Noah still has the scars, but he's absolutely living a great life. He's, he's just an adorable dog. And so again, why adopt a rescue dog? Because there are so many Noahs out there, you know? So why buy from, from a, you know, a dog that may come from a puppy mill or, or, I mean, I understand why people sometimes want a dog from a breeder. I'm not against that, and there are good ones. Um, but you, you know, you've got to make sure you're working with a good one. But again, I think there are compelling reasons why you adopt a rescue dog. Um, this dog, Lola, was in a shelter in Baltimore. And this fellow walked in one day and said, I want whatever dog has been here the longest, the one you have been unable to adopt. I don't care what the sex, I don't care the breed, I don't care the age. And he was matched with Lola, who'd been overbred at many litters. She was about, I think about seven years old. And that would have been the end of the story, but a shelter volunteer recognized him. Um, partially because he's 6'6 six, six and weighs over 300 pounds. <laughs> and his, his name is Ronnie Stanley, and he was about to start his rookie season with the Baltimore Ravens, and so it became kind of a story in Baltimore and then a national story. So Lowell is another answer to that question, you know, why adopt a rescue dog? Um, I want to briefly take you outside the United States for a moment and tell you about pot cakes, and you'll see why in a moment. So we were on vacation a few years ago in Turks and Caicos and learned that there are feral dogs on, native to the, uh, that live on the island and, and in the Bahamas called pot cakes. And they got this name because people who live on the islands, would, their strays, would feed them the caked remains of a traditional rice and bean dish. You know, they'd scrape it out and they would feed it to the dogs. And there's a little rescue down on the main island in Turks and Caicos, and if you're missing your dog and you're on vacation, you can do what we did, which is go over in the morning. They're always looking for people to help socialize these puppies. And they'll give you a little bag with a ball and water. And you can walk across the street to the beach and hang out with one of these puppies for a few hours. It's awesome. So the reason I wanted to tell you about pot cakes um, was really to introduce you to the girl in the next picture. So a couple of years ago, I was at a, another library near here. And uh, a little girl came in with her dad. and. It was, I always made a point before the talk, if I saw young kids, to go over and talk to them and their parents, because I said, look, some of these stories are really sad, you know. Um, there's a lot, some happy endings, most of the stories I'm going to tell you have happy endings, but I wanted to prepare them, make sure it was okay. And this little girl was eight at the time, and she, she kind of waved her hand, and she said, I've already read your book. <laughs> <laughs> and she was so adorable, and I... Later, found, uh, what I learned was that she and her dad um, were adopting pot cakes from the Bahamas. They had been to the Bahamas, and she had learned all about the plight of these dogs down there. And she started to she started her own little rescue called Tegan's Treasures in Wakefield, and started raising money for this rescue in the Bahamas. And at this point, it raised almost six thousand dollars, but now well over ten, maybe even more, twelve. And um, a couple of years ago was recognized for this um, by getting to throw out the first pitch at Fenway Park. Awesome. And when I asked Tegan, you know, this, this question about why a rescue dog, this is what she said to me. She said, if you get a dog from a breeder, it's just a random dog. It's not in danger. The dogs in the Bahamas are dying, and they treat dogs as pests instead of pets. Oh, you might have out. Oh, sorry. Oh, it went out? Stopped working? It's, it's on. <laughs> It's on? Okay. So I had a feeling, I, I was, um, when I did my first talk about this book in Wellesley, Tegan joined me, um, 
Our dad's here tonight, Brian, and I want to just give him a chance to tell you about what they're doing. They're right here in Wakefield, and she's just an incredible kid. She's, what, 11 now? She's 10. 10, still 10. <laughs> she's been 10 for two years. <laughs> but she's absolutely adorable and so committed to this. And, you know, it's so great to see a kid this age pour her heart and soul into something so worthwhile. So I want to introduce you to, to Brian, Deegan's dad, just to tell you a little bit about what they're doing. So we live in Wakefield, and my daughter is uh, 10, and I'd like to keep her 10 for about five more years. So um, she'll be 11 in August. But we do a lot of work with a rescue called the Voiceless Dogs of Nassau that does work single woman operation. She has 90 dogs right now at a refuge by herself that she pulls off the streets, vets, gets ready, gets them acclimated, and ships them to the states to various rescues here in the states where people can adopt them. She has a Facebook page, phenomenal. It's, what she does is, is truly amazing. We had adopted a dog locally at Northeast Animal Shelter and took it home. And we wanted to find that dog a friend. So another friend of ours had a dog that she had rescued that had puppies. And we were going to adopt one of those puppies. While we were waiting, we learned about fostering. Which, if you're contemplating a dog, fostering, absolutely awesome way to figure out if you can truly handle it or not. Um, if you're not sure, not a dog person, but you want to find out, fostering through a rescue, phenomenal way to learn. We had contacted a rescue in New York about fostering a dog, and we got freckles. So, freckles at the time, we didn't know his age. It was estimated between seven and nine years old. He had lived at a strip mall in Nassau, uh, never had a home, sat in front of a strip mall, had been abused, hit by a motorcycle, um, you name it, this dog had gone through it and was the gentlest spirit dog ever met. So the day we got him as a foster, we knew nothing about it. We had just kind of started in the, in the rescue journey. And the woman said, I've got this great foster. Meet me at Petco in 10 minutes. We're literally driving by and we jumped in the car and ran to Petco. And I had a six-year-old girl at the time, and my daughter, I said, this dog is a wild street dog that's never been in the home, and you want me to put this dog with my six-year-old kid? Are you guys crazy? And we met the dog, and that night, that dog came home, curled up around Tegan's head. We, we lost the dog. In December. But he has inspired my daughter to do so much. He changed the world for her. So I'm sorry. This is tough. But she's raised twelve thousand dollars. We've also done some stuff with local rescues lately. Yeah. Sorry. I just turned 46 and I'm crying like I'm 10. Yeah. You got a <laughs> but we worked with the local school lately. She is a student at the Woodville. She's about to go to the Galvin next year. And uh, the PTO has been very supportive. We just organized some blanket and towel drives. And we were able to donate over a thousand blankets and towels to Northeast Animal Shelter and to Nevin's Farm. Uh, we're still fundraising, doing a lot of work for the Voiceless Dogs of Nassau. Tegan designs shirts and sweatshirts and t-shirts and has a Facebook page. And she's trying to learn more to do active things. Her latest thing, because of dogs like Freckles, is adopt a senior dog. When you work with rescue, the first thing you find out, those dogs are almost always unadoptable. Injured dogs, senior dogs, and unfortunately, 
black dogs, and ironically, it's because they don't photograph well and people don't see them. So if you want to make a difference to some dogs that struggle even more than the regular rescue dogs, look at dogs like that. Freckles changed our world. And dogs like that do need loving homes because that dog had been through hell and was the sweetest soul you would ever meet. And that's why she goes that route, you know. And I just say that, you know, what Peter's done with this book and educating people and what Greg does with Rescue Road and what your local shelters do and everything else, bringing dogs up from the south, it is huge because those dogs just do not have a chance without help. And it's people like you that are going to make a difference for those dogs. So thank you. shelters in this country every year. At the same time, puppy mills are producing the same number or more. So the reasons to adopt a rescue dog are Noah and Stormy and uh, Lola and Albie, who as you can see now, sleeps on, <laughs> sleeps on Egyptian cot. Um, now, one thing you have to realize is that you know, whenever we get a, you decide you're going to adopt a dog, wherever you're going to get a dog from, all you think about is this fluffy, perfectly clean puppy running through a wheat field somewhere in Nebraska. And it ain't always like that. And uh, I'll just give you an example. So we have, these are our first two rescue dogs, Albie and then Selena, who I met on Greg's truck and then could not part with. She was a puppy. Um, this is how they travel in the car together. They've been together four years. When they are not in the car, it is never like that. <laughs> the only stick that matters in the world is the stick the other one has. The only ball that matters is the one the other one has. So, you know, it's like, it's like having a six and eight year two, you know, six and eight year old boys. It's not always like that. When dogs come into your home, and they can be from anywhere, I mean, whether they're rescues or not, some dogs, you know, dogs are like people. They're individuals. Some have anxieties, and they will sometimes act out on their anxiety. <laughs> These things may happen, and you, it never helps to strike a dog, okay, over something they're doing. It's your job to figure out why they're doing this, um, and to be patient and understanding. I think the main reason adoptions don't succeed is unrealistic expectations on the part of the human, who don't often allow for the fact that these are dogs, they are individuals, and just like people, they have their neuroses, they have their anxieties. I want to just give you a couple of other examples. We um, go down near Charleston every winter now for a few weeks and um, drive down with the dogs. And a couple of years ago, you know, after two days in the car, they couldn't wait to get out and run on the beach. And it was a beautiful Hallmark moment. This is the two of them right after we arrived. And then I look over and I see that Selena is eating something on the beach, and I don't know what it is. And I go over, and, I, and I, then I start to realize thousands of starfish had washed up on this beach uh, that winter. And I thought, oh my god. And I, by that time, she'd probably eaten a half a dozen. It's like, <laughs> like seafood buffet at Golden Corral. You know, she's just like, yeah, and they're like leather, you know. And I remember reading somewhere that starfish were toxic. So all of a sudden, I'm freaked out. And we rush the dogs back to the place for staying up the beach. And I start making phone calls to veterinarians. And nobody's ever heard of a dog eating starfish. <laughs> and they don't know if they're toxic. And they tell us to just keep an eye on her and see how she does. Now, I won't make it, I'll, I'll be discreet about this. They, they were not toxic. And we had a devil of a time keeping her away from them, even on a leash, all week long. But we did need to make sure that exactly two hours after she ever ate a starfish, we had to be outside. <laughs> Same vacation. The next day, the dogs are running on the beach, chasing each other. And Albie, who's not quite as agile, makes a turn to you know, 
makes a hard turn to chase Selena, and he goes down in a heap. He lifts his paw in the air, and I can see he's really hurt himself. And I go over, and he's trembling, and he's in pain. And you know, at that moment, you realize how much you do. You love these dogs. I mean, how you identify, and you just, you know, in that moment, I wished I could tell him it was going to be okay. We were going to get him to a doctor. And they don't understand that. You, know, you only can hope that the sound of your voice helps. So I carry him, 75 pounds, back to where we're staying. And I'm on the phone to the same vets I called yesterday <laughs> about starfish. They're like, who is this guy from Boston? <laughs> It turned out he hadn't broken anything. He limped the whole time. It turns out, we didn't know this until we got back and we saw a specialist down at Tufts in Walpole, that he had fairly advanced arthritis. And it was, he obviously had done something to aggravate it. And, and God bless Albie. This is Albie at the vet getting a laser treatment. I just love this. <laughs> so, you know, the point is, you know, there are going to be vet bills. There are going to be accidents. There are going to be things they eat. They're going to drag stuff into the house. They're going to chew up your favorite shoes. That's part of the package. If you're not ready for that, you should get a stuffed animal. <laughs> so my bottom line is, yes, the dogs need to learn how to live in the house. We need to train them to live in the house. But more importantly, it's our job to learn how to live with a dog and let them be a dog. They don't speak English. They don't have reasoning powers. So you have to understand that. Um, when I was working on Rescued, I talked to um, a lot of people about their experience. And you know, you hear so many stories about what these dogs give back, you know, their empathy, their ability to intuit when we're grieving or sad or having a tough time. And I just want to quickly tell you a couple of stories of two people I interviewed for the book. Another person I met when I was doing book talks for Rescue Road was this woman, Ellen Lee who uh, came to Porter Square Books, and she's wheelchair-bound, and she came with her dog, Ricky. Um, and Ricky is a service dog trained at Needs out in Princeton, Mass. You may be familiar, National Education Assistance Dog Services. And they, many of the dogs they train are rescues, not all of them, um, but they train them for vets who have PTSD, um, people who are hearing impaired, different skill sets that these dogs have to help people with their activities of daily living. But what really came across to me, and I met Ellen a couple weeks later for coffee because I was very interested in learning about this because Ricky was amazing. He helped her take off her coat and put it on, and he was so well behaved. And she said, having Ricky you know, take care of her was important, but now she had Ricky to take care of. And she, hadn't, you know, she couldn't work, she can't work anymore. So having him in her life has really been therapeutic for her. It's opened up a lot of social avenues. Whenever she goes out, people want to talk about Ricky and meet him. And he's literally gotten her out of her apartment um, and out into the wider world. Another person I interviewed for the book by phone, um, because he was still incarcerated in Florida, uh, was this fellow, Jason Bertram. There are, you probably familiar with these programs. There are a lot of programs around the country that are called Paws and Prisoners programs. A lot of rescues will help get their dogs socialized and ready for adoption by bringing them to prisons and pairing them with a prisoner who volunteers to join the program to help socialize and train these dogs. And Jason was very unusual and the, the rescue saw that they were, they had an incredible bond. And he was about to be released from prison after serving 17 years, he was only 34 years old. And when I talked to him by phone, you know, he told me so many things. But one thing he said, he said, this is the only non-judgmental companionship I've had in 17 years. And in prison, we all walk around with a tough guy mask on. And this dog just melts my heart. And I was in Jacksonville last month, and I met Jason. He came back to talk to the guys who are in the program now. And, you know, these are all guys serving serious time. And when those dogs, when they, they took me out and showed, you know, they, they paired up with their dogs, they're like kids. Absolutely therapeutic for these people. And, um, you know, it brings out their humanity and it drops the facade of being the tough guy. And Jason's now married and the dog, he adopted the dog. And she's just, he just, he 
He weeps whenever he talks about what she's done for him. But one of the things I realized talking to people, many of whom had stories that were not quite this dramatic, was that all these dogs are therapy dogs in one way or another. And I tried to figure out, you know, so what is it that makes them so therapeutic to be around? One of them is they live in the moment. You know, like Brian was talking about freckles, you know, with this terrible background, they, you know, they, they probably carry it with them some way, and some may be beyond redemption, and they've just become so fearful they can't be socialized, but most of them, they don't live in the past. They don't wake up like, like this dog, Zosha, lost her hind legs in a terrible accident. The woman who adopted her said, she doesn't wake up and think, oh, you know, it's, it's terrible, I don't have my legs. She just goes out and runs anyway, you know, even if she's not in her little contraption. So it's that kind of, you know, I think we all wish we could be more mindful of our time, more present in the moment, and I think that's what these dogs do for us. This is a group of rescued labs who live up in Guilford, Vermont, with a woman named Adrian Finney. They're all rescues. And um, I've been up there, and you, know, you see this, I forget, I can't even remember all their names, but the one with the tennis ball. When I watch my own dogs with sticks or tennis balls, I think, oh, would my life be better? if I was this happy with this little, right? And you, you may have seen this next thing go around on the internet, but I think it sums it up. Yeah. You know, so all your things you're thinking about, about your day, and things you're working, all the dog's thinking about is, I'm with this guy. That's all he cares about, right? So that's what I think it is that they, you know, they remind us to be mindful of our time. Now, as I'm coming to the end, um, when I outlined this last book, I did not plan to write about what it's like to lose a dog. And you, you know, what any of you have, and as you see Brian talk about freckles, and I, it's, it's a real loss, you know, it's a real loss. And I heard some amazing stories. So the very first person that I interviewed for this book made me realize that I was going to have to write about this subject. So a woman named Stacy Schultz, her husband Brad out in Ohio, um, Adopted Jake when he was 11 and a half, senior dog. And he was at a sanctuary for older dogs, not ever expecting to be adopted. He was pretty much there for his life. And they learned that he had lived his first 10 years chained to a stake in, in a backyard in Ohio in all kinds of weather, completely unsocialized. But there was something about him. She said, there was something about him when we saw him. We thought, you know, we, we can do this. And they brought Jake home. and. He was kind of wild, and he ran away 40 miles away. Um, and he was, he was a, a handful. And they found out just a few months later that he had uh, osteosarcoma, which was gonna, going to kill him. And Stacy said, we were just so determined, given how much he'd suffered in life, that we were going to look for the day. We just didn't want him to ever have to suffer. We, you know, we would just give him all the time we could until we reached that point. And when they finally decided they had reached that point, and he was about 12, I think they had had him less than a year, um, she was consoled by a friend who said, you taught him what heaven would be like. You know, he finally had a chance to have a family to call his own. And I heard so many stories like this that were so powerful, including this one about a dog named Bo, a rescue dog, um, adopted about age nine by the Smith family in upstate New York. And he had a lot of medical problems he lost control of his back legs, he had spinal cord degeneration, and so near the end of his life, they rigged up what they called the Bone Mobile, and they took him to all of his favorite places. But this is the one that's really gonna get you, because it gets me every time. Allison Smith said, this was October of 2016, I think, and he was really near the end, and Bo always loved the winter, and he loved the snow, but it was just late September, and he didn't have much time left, and they got an idea. And they called the hockey rink at Rensselaer and had a load of for Bo. And Bo spent his last couple of weeks lying on his snow pile. So, you know, the point of these stories is that, you know, as hard as these moments are, and I, I gotta tell you, I don't think Albie had been with us a week when all of a sudden it dawned to me that one day we were gonna lose him, and I was already freaking out about it. Um, they, they draw, they bring out our most compassionate selves, you know. And when I, this is Albie and me in the woods near our house. 
So when I look at Albie, you know, chasing something through the woods that I can't see, um, or s sleeping soundly, well fed, warm, and I think all, that on any one of 150 days in that shelter could have been his last day, and he never would have had a chance. And yet, you know, he's the light of our life. I mean, I just love this dog so much, and it makes the relate to me. It makes the relationship with the dog so much more meaningful to know that if you hadn't stepped up, the dog might not be here. So I just want to circle back and tell you about Stormy, a dog with Parvo abandoned during a hurricane. So Tom nursed her back to health, and she did recover. And in September, I wrote a column for the Globe, Who Will Step Up for the Dogs of Houston? And I mainly focused on the story of this little dog. And unbeknownst to me, um, Tom got a call from a doctor in North Carolina who came across the story online. And he's also happens to be a private pilot. And he flew down to Texas to meet Tom and to meet Stormy and to bring her home. Oh. And so he brought her home. They live on a big farm in North Carolina. They've got four other dogs, some of whom are dubious about the arrangement. <laughs> but she's doing great. It's a happy ending, you know. So that's why you rescue uh, a dog. So we have three. <laughs> I didn't tell you that. Um, and they're all very different personalities. Um, and it's a bit more than we had planned on. Selena, I described that I met her on the truck with Greg as the canine equivalent of an unplanned pregnancy. <laughs> um, we, weren't, we weren't looking for a dog but after five days. I was so smitten with this dog, we took her on as a puppy. She was going to an adoption event. And then uh, Jamba. And they're all from uh, Louisiana. And they are a handful, but, you know, it's, it, it's great. I mean, so I encourage you, don't stop at one. <laughs> so thank you all. For, I'm happy to answer any questions or if you have a story you want to share. This is the time. We'll turn the lights. Thank you. story. So she's a rare case. I mean, we adopted her as a puppy, but I was able to find out who she, who, whose dog had her as a puppy. And I called this young man, his name was, was C.J. Nash. He was in high school at the time. And they lived 15 miles outside of Natchitoches in the middle of nowhere. Young African-American kid. And his dog had given birth to this litter of puppies. And his dad said, You've got to take him to the pound. We can't afford to have all these puppies. And he knew that was a death sentence. So he called a friend's mom who he knew was affiliated with one of the Humane Societies. And with the help of that woman and Carrie Toth, who was our adoption coordinator for Albie, they saved all these puppies. And so Selena came from that exact area. And it was interesting because CJ, who we are con continuing to be in touch with, and he actually, I got him an internship in Boston a few years ago. And, We've stayed in touch. Again, the kid lives in a very remote part of Louisiana. He was very well aware of how differently we live with dogs up here as compared to where he lives. But he said the dogs don't come in the house. We would never think of having the dog in the house, let alone sleep in the bed um, or in the kitchen. And we can't afford veterinary care. You know, we live paycheck to paycheck. And if the, dog, if the dogs wander, and they're not spayed and neutered, so you, you know you get a sense of how this problem gets out of control. But but Selena is from exactly that area, yeah. Somebody else? Yes. Um, I've also had um, rescued greyhounds, former racers, and that's also a 
good way to go. There's a, there's a great, I, a number of, someone came to my talk on the Greyhound Rescue here in Massachusetts. There's, there is one. Yeah, yeah, is there's one in Salisbury uh, <coughs> and, and Menden, there's a couple of them. Yeah, there's a couple of Greyhound Rescues in the area. Anyone, yes? Um, I read your first book, I'm in the middle of the well, What was your favorite part of being Greg? I mean, I, there were some parts of the book that I had to kind of skip over because it's too tragic, and I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, leave the lights on, you know, got my dogs around me while yeah. I'm reading it. But what was, like, would you say the most favorite part of traveling? So the question was, what was my favorite part about traveling with Greg? It, it was not the food or the accommodations. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because I literally slept in a sleeping bag on the floor of the trailer with all the dogs, because Greg doesn't leave the trailer. He sleeps in that trailer um, every night. You know, it was probably the moment, and I remember this very clearly, and you may remember from the first book. On the first full trip I made with Greg, we pulled into a parking lot in Connecticut, in Guilford, where people were waiting, probably 40 people, families, waiting to meet their dogs. And you know, as soon as the truck appears, people they just they just erupt, and people have signs, and you know, <laughs> so excited. And the truck came to a stop, and you hear the air go out of the brakes. And Greg just sat there for a minute. It was very quiet. And I was like, okay, what's going on here? And he just started to talk after about a minute. He was looking out the window, and I think at that point we'd been together enough. He wasn't so much thinking about talking for me. He was just reflecting. And he said, you know, he said, a few days ago, all these dogs were going to die. And now they will, the door's going to swing open, the light's going to come in, and every one of them is going to go into the arms of a loving family. And then he said, this is heaven. Aww. And, um, that, you know, I just remember thinking, yeah, it's like a writer's, writer's dream. You know, <laughs> something, say something like that spontaneously. But I think it was just... Those moments of seeing these dogs united with their families, the excitement, was, was probably the best part. Videos that you put on Facebook. Yeah, go on, you know, if you're looking, if you're looking for a little respite from all the good news, um, <laughs> uh, go to Rescue Road Trips on Facebook. Because Greg, one of the, I, I, I talk about this when I did the talk about Rescue Road. He, he's on Facebook the whole trip every other week, so people can follow his progress. In fact. When he and Albie, before we had met Albie, when they crossed the Mason-Dixon line, he, he happened to take a picture of him with Albie sitting, when Albie was sitting up with his paws in Greg's lap. Aww. And that was the first time I even knew anything about Greg or who he was. So it's very comforting for those who are waiting for dogs to follow these trips as they happen. Um, but it's just, you know, when he goes, he's got groups of volunteers that have sprung up organically in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, and now it's at Hartford who meet the truck every other week, 20 to 30 people, to give him a break, give the dogs an extended break, get them out for long walks, give them treats and stuff. And you see all that in it every week as he posts on Facebook. So it's, it's very uplifting. You know? uh, to see it. Um, yes. You alluded to some of the reasons there are some of these phrases in the South. In, in your research, have you developed, um, I guess, an opinion or some thoughts over how the problem can be limited? And how does 750 stray dogs in Houston not become a million yeah. stray dogs? So if you talk to people who do this work, Greg, Kerry, they will almost always tell you, well, I'm not solving the big problem. I'm just saving the next dog. Because, and it, you know, you, you, you wish there was an easy answer. Oh, everybody should spay neuter. When you've got three quarters of a million strays out there who don't even have someone to bring them to be spayed and neutered, you've got a problem that's mathematically out of control. Now, all's not lost because 50 years ago in New England, the Northeast Animal Shelter would have been filled with dogs from this area. Um, now, many of the rescues here are bringing dogs up from the south because they've got the room. So over decades of education, of awareness, of, you know, you don't see it, it's very rare. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen an unaltered male dog since I've lived in New England. I've been here since I went to college. 
Um, you go down south, you see it all the time. Um, so while spay neuter is obviously an answer, there's a deeper question: well, why, why isn't there a culture, a strong culture of spay neuter there? And I think you know, yeah, I heard this from southerners, so it's not me preaching about southerners. They say, you know, don't forget, many of the people doing this great work who are saving these dogs, they're southerners too. They say, you know what? It is so slow to change here. Attitudes are very, very slow to change. And if this is the way I grew up, my, you know, if I grew up as a kid with yard dogs, and my grandfather had yard dogs, and his father before him, it just becomes this kind of thing. Now, the attitude, so a lot of this is rooted in attitudes, and I can only explain it with this anecdote. So many people who went do dog rescue in the South would tell me some version of this story. Oh, I was at a gas station, and I saw some guy kicking his dog. So I went over to say something to him. And the response is, what do you care? It's just a dog. And I think in that phrase tells you almost everything about the root of the problem. It's just a dog. So it's not worthy of your compassion. And what do you care? Just, just as a follow-up, does the, has the government attempted to get involved beyond not euthanasia, but um, you know, maybe a program where they pay people so you can stay in the Well, there are many, the yes, but many of the local shelters will have, you know, $5 spay in adoption clinics, and mm -hmm. there are private groups that will spay neuter for free. The question is, there's not enough of it to go around. Um, in terms of government solutions, so there's also, again, I don't want to make this political, but in the South, there's a lot of resistance to people saying, I don't want government telling me how to take care of my dog. And um, so there, there could be all the laws on the books, you know, but is this going to be a high enforcement priority for a police and prosecutor who's overburdened with an opioid crisis and everything else that's going on? No, you know, it's a matter of, even if you have the laws, who's going to enforce them? You know? So it's a complicated problem and unfortunately it doesn't have an easy answer. Yeah. Do you know if there's ever been, I, I've often thought about whether um, there were ever programs where people from out of state, like in our states, could donate to spaying and neutering programs in the South or do like mobile space? I know it's about attitude. Way. You know, like if they ever had like mobile spay and neutering. Oh, well, they do. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, but like they, Well, we take it for granted that, you know, first of all, um, almost any rescue sending a dog up here will either, the dog will either already be spayed and neutered or you'll be required right. under the contract uh, to get the dog spayed and neutered. People don't even question it, really. I mean, we take it for granted. There are spayed and neutered mobile clinics that, in, in places like Houston. But again, you know, how do you deal with hundreds of thousands right. of dogs? Sorry? Wasn't that your friend that donated the Teagans thing that used to do the spay and neuter clinics in Turks and... So, so I met a guy down in Turks and Caicos from Londonderry, New Hampshire, who goes down every few weeks, and he, he and a, a veterinarian from Toronto had a plan that they presented to the government down there for non-surgical spay and neuter. Apparently there are things you can leave out that will be effective for a couple of years. You know, the dog will just eat. Um, and the government rejected. They weren't willing to finance the whole thing. Um, and they just went back to their old ways, which is occasionally culling the feral population, mainly because tourists don't like to get down and see dogs running around. They're intimidated. They're, it's unpleasant. They, they, you know, so there's a lot of pressure from the tourist industry in these places to make sure the problem is invisible. Um, you know, so it's... It be a tough sell. Uh, yes. It's the same in Honduras, Belize. You know, yeah. we, we were there and we were on a cruise ship and we got off and all people were talking about was the feral dogs, the moms with the teats, and you know she has a litter somewhere and it was so sad. She's and she's emaciated. Yeah. So she's giving everything she has to those pups, and where are they? They're hidden somewhere. And she's, and she's, she's begging for food because she can't produce milk. 
Right, and they'll get pressure from the cruise ship industry to say, look, you know, we're bringing all these people here, and this isn't not right. what they want it to was, see. It was very disturbing. So there's a lot of pressure on these local governments to do something dramatic about the problem. But it's not the dog's problem. No. It's not the dog's We We adopted a dog from Northeast Animal Shelter, and we named him Maximilian, and he came true to his name. <laughs> Tom Brady knee surgery, <laughs> six eye surgeries. <laughs> Will we be ready for next season? Uh, <laughs> we now have a tank. <laughs> I've been volunteering with the New England Ribbon Rescue now for about 13 years. And like you say, they all come from the South because they don't have leash doors. And uh, Brittany is a hunting dog. It's a bird dog and likes to hunt. And if they don't work out as a good hunting dog, they let them loose. Yeah, they just cut them loose yeah. and they want them to go. Yeah. So that's why we pick up so many of the hunting dogs, because they're just a commodity. Yeah. The irregular dogs live in the house, and they live outside, and they feel like hunting with them. They take them out. If they don't work out, then they're yeah, Folks in Louisiana told me, at the end of hunting season, there's always a surge of insects at the local shelters. Um, and I, that was actually became our theory. I mean, I don't know if it's true that Albie was a failed hunting dog because he's a lab and he won't swim. <laughs> and so if he didn't, you know, probably somebody just said, well, in the water for a duck. Yeah. yeah. So but. He won't even go in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you mentioned earlier that in Massachusetts they have this rule about quarantining dogs, which is kind of um, a pain in the neck. But um, we actually, we rescued some dogs from Georgia uh, between my friends and me, about five of them all together, and he adopted one of the ones I decided to foster. Um, if you just go across the state border, <laughs> you can just pick them up right from the top. Okay, that's a We went to Delaware to get ours because we couldn't wait. <laughs> I, I won't get too legal about it, but I, I did used to be a lawyer. And I have looked into this very carefully. You can, if you live in Massachusetts, Meet Greg in Connecticut. You will not get in trouble. There's no penalty provided. And then, by the way, this is all in Massachusetts under the auspices of a 2005 emergency order of the Department of Agriculture. There are no regulations. It's a one-page order that's still sitting out there. Um, however, Greg and the rescue we have to be licensed in Massachusetts. They're the ones that are at risk. So some rescues will work with you. Some say, you know, we're just not going to risk it. Um, I, so here, here's the thing about the quarantine in Massachusetts. People like Greg, who got all the paperwork required of these dogs, um, does it all right by the book, OK? He's really not the problem, but he's the one that gets inspected, obviously. Somebody gets, says, I'm a rescue, they drive down in a van, they put 50 puppies in a van. They're not stopping for inspection. They're not, you know, nobody's stopping them at the border. So the problem with the quarantine, although I understand the rationale behind it, is supposed to make sure that these dogs are not carrying disease, is that the net is, it's really only catching the people swimming in the legitimate lane yeah. is not catching ever anyone who's operating off, you know, who's not licensed. That's really where the problem is, but they don't have the enforcement resources. So it really just makes, I think, makes life tough on the rescues um, for the dogs that are really least likely to be at risk. Are the dogs required in Massachusetts to, do they update all their shots so they is that part of the part? Part of well, well, part of the paperwork. You know, you have to have um, proof of vaccination from you know certificates Wherever signed, they came out of state right. veterinarians, spay neuter records, whatever. I mean, it's, you know, there are all these requirements, but you know, it's, it's the legitimate. Unfortunately, it's the legitimate operators that are sort of inspected and sort of jump through all the hoops to make sure that they, they continue to operate here. Um, but, you know, but but the other thing is. Nothing stops you. I could have driven down to Louisiana to pick up Algie myself, and he wouldn't have been subject to the quarantine. So that was the Louisiana license. Right. That, 
that's 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 why. I mean. So we did we did adopt from a legitimate rescue in Georgia, and we had all of our paperwork and veterinary records and everything like that. So it's just a silly. Well, the other thing is, it was interesting. Just, if, you do your, if you do your due diligence, you the can Department of Agriculture says that the, that the quarantine does not apply to own pets. Now, when I adopted, we adopted Albie and we sent the check and they sent a contract. He would, he, we owned him at that point. He was still in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So technically, isn't he an owned pet? I mean, it, the whole area is very murky and the rescues are a little reluctant to kick up this issue because they don't want to make it worse. They, you know, they don't want the quarantine to go to seven days or whatever. And there's occasionally there are efforts at the state house to bring some rationality to the process, but it hasn't gone anywhere. Why well, are there no other states around that have that quarantine? Well, they do. Like I rescued a dog, a senior dog from Vermont who was in a veterinary for months. I can't remember the rules in every state, but there are other New England states that require quarantine. Some have, I think Rhode Island, you can apply to be exempt if you have a good track record. If you're a rescue with a long track record, you haven't had any problems, you can get exemptions. It's different from state to state. Mm -hmm. Yes? How does um, Greg keep sold together? How does, uh, who's paying him? Yeah. So, so Rescue Road Trips is now a nonprofit. It used to be an LLC. Uh -huh. But he charges a transport fee for every dog. So it's a fixed fee, no matter what the distance, no matter how big the dog. But, you know, a lot of people, I remember after Rescue Road came out, they, they sit down and think, well, he's charging 100 and something a dog, and there's 80 dogs, and they do the math, and they think he's making, making a million bucks. Well, you know, is he, you know what it costs to run that truck? Mm -hmm. And we just got a new one. I mean, that's a million dollar rig, okay. a new one, and, you know, the gas alone is thousands a month. You go through tires every trip. Um, Insurance, license, you know, it's a salary to another driver, it's his income. And it's 24 7 work. Even when he's home in the weeks in between trips, it's the reservations, it's the website, it's a million calls. Um, it's constant. So, you know, yeah, it looks like a lot of money is coming in, but a lot of money is going out. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Haley Booksellers, which is not a brick and mortar store, she's in the back. If you want to buy books, happy to sign them. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.